Hamlin trolls fans, Richmond may be on the chopping block, and I've got a new number one at the top of my NASCAR power rankings. How's it going, y'all? My name is Eric. Welcome to Out of the Groove. Happy Monday. It's been nearly 24 hours, but fans are still buzzing about last night's controversial Richmond finish. Denny Hamlin scored his second victory of the season despite multiple camera angles now showing that he clearly jumped the final restart. This onboard angle from Truex that's been circulating clearly shows the 11 jumping before that first white line. NASCAR race control did not review the incident in the moment. NASCAR officials said after the race that they deemed the restart good. I've been waiting to hear Denny Hamlin's response. His uh, podcast, Actions Detrimental, just dropped, so I'm going to listen to it this evening and we'll react to anything Hamlin says tomorrow. For now, Denny Hamlin did uh, tease fans with this post. After much consideration, talks with the team, and dissecting the SMT data, it is clear that I jumped the start. Because of that, I've decided to do the right thing and wish you a happy April Fool's Day. I can already see NASCAR officials in a dark room somewhere studying this tweet the way they studied Hamlin's comments post-Phoenix last year. (laughs) In all seriousness, I don't blame Denny Hamlin for being aggressive. I think he did the right thing. Put NASCAR in the uncomfortable position of having to make that call. I don't blame him for what he did. I do blame NASCAR, however, for not taking a closer look at that restart in the moment. They should have had the stones to make the right call, in my opinion, but I'm going to wait until I hear Denny Hamlin's comments comments on his podcast before I react further. This afternoon, I read a piece from Jordan Bianchi, The Athletic. I'll link it down in the description below. In this column, Bianchi argues that Richmond should lose one of its two NASCAR Cup Series dates. This has been a talking point now for at least a couple of years, and I think one of the main points Jordan makes in this piece is an extremely valid one. NASCAR is continuing to add new tracks, new venues, new markets to the schedule. Iowa, Chicago, Gateway, North Wilkesboro. Every new track NASCAR adds to the schedule typically comes at the expense of an existing one. Off the top of my head, Pocono, Michigan, Texas, New Hampshire have all lost a date in recent years. If next season NASCAR adds a race in Mexico or Montreal, Canada or somewhere else, it's going to replace an existing race. And since typically it's NASCAR promoting these new venues, it's logical to assume a NASCAR-owned track will lose a date. So let's take a look at some options. Darlington is owned by NASCAR. They have two dates. The spring date, which has landed on Mother's Day the past couple of years, is a great setting for throwback weekend, but fans don't pack the grandstands like they do for the Southern 500 later in the year. Kansas Speedway, two races a year. They've struggled to pack the stands for both. The reason I think Kansas will stick around is because the next gen has put on phenomenal shows at that mile and a half the past two years. Still, it's one to watch. There's Martinsville Speedway. This might be sacrilegious, but the spring Martinsville race has been borderline unwatchable two years in a row. I'm not holding my breath this weekend. That fall race isn't going anywhere. That's still must-see TV, but the spring date? Hey, question mark. What about Phoenix? Uh, Phoenix is not going anywhere, I'm afraid to say. They packed the grandstands both spring and fall. NASCAR poured millions into that track just a few years ago for renovations. Phoenix is here to stay. Daytona's not losing a date. I don't think Talladega is losing a date. So, I mean, not many tracks are left. Let's look at Richmond. Richmond Raceway has not consistently featured action-packed racing for years now. Even before the next-gen car, these races largely turned into long runs, strategy. Jordan Bianchi offered a lot of great statistics in that article. Again, I encourage you to go check it out. Good racing is obviously subjective. Some folks, I'm sure, love Richmond. I'm sure Richmond holds nostalgic value for many fans in the area who grew up going to races. It's tough. I hate to see any legacy track lose a date. Like I mentioned, Darlington, Martinsville. I don't want to see NASCAR only go there once a year. Those are some great tracks, great historic venues. But if NASCAR is going to keep injecting some much needed life and energy into the Cup Series schedule, 
at some point, some of these old school tracks with two dates are gonna you know, pay the price. Most of these new tracks NASCAR's added to the schedule have been huge hits. I mean, North Wilkesboro packed the stands last summer. Gateway in St. Louis has packed the grandstands the past couple of years. The Chicago Street Race was the second most viewed NASCAR Cup Series race all of last season. Much of these new dates have been huge hits. I have no doubt that a race in Mexico or in Montreal would also be a big hit. NASCAR is going to have to run some calculations. Which date can they afford to lose to make room for some of these new venues? I hate to say it, but I do think Richmond Raceway should be at the top of that list. I'm not talking about cutting both Richmond dates. Of course not. Just one. One Richmond race a year is sufficient in my opinion, but let me know what you think down in the comment section below. I just listed a bunch of NASCAR owned tracks with two dates currently. Is there a different venue that you'd rather see lose one of their dates? Let me know what you think down in the comment section below. It's that time folks. The start of a new week means a brand new edition of my weekly out of the groove power rankings where I rank the 10 fastest overall drivers and cars in the NASCAR Cup Series right now. Let's get to it. A few honorable mentions real quick because I know I'll get comments. Joey Logano, strong second place run, but that was his first top five finish of the year. I need to see more consistency before he cracks this list. Same can be said about Chase Elliott. Also just scored his first top five finish, but at least he has shown top five speed in back-to-back -back weeks. And Alex Bowman, man, he barely made my top 10 last week. I think he had top five speed at Richmond, got screwed by that untimely, weak Kyle Busch caution in stage two. I hate to bump him out. Eight through like 12th on my list is so dang tight. Let's just get to number 10. I've got Ross Chastain. Six straight top 15 finishes. He's inside the top 10 in points. He's not leading a ton of laps, but he's always in the mix. And unlike this time last year, I don't think he's at the top of anyone's hit list thus far. So solid start to the year for Ross Chastain all around. At number nine, enter Chris Busher. He is tied now for the Cup Series lead with five top 10 finishes. He's up to 12th in points. He's starting to look like the round of eight contender he was at the end of last season. Both RFK Fords look pretty good to start the year. I don't think they've missed a beat. I'll stick with Tyler Reddick in the eight spot. Look, take out Bristol a couple weeks ago where you know, bold pitch strategy put him in harm's way. He got wrecked early, finished 30th. But take out Bristol, Tyler Reddick's average finish is 6.7 the last four races. Across four very different types of tracks, intermediate, short tracks, road course. Reddick has also earned the fifth most stage points thus far. He hasn't won a race yet, but he's shown race winning speed at Las Vegas, at Phoenix. I like where Tyler Reddick is at right now. No change this week for Ty Gibbs either. Finished 16th at Richmond, kind of a quiet day. But the young 21 year old second year driver is still tied for the most top fives in cup with three and the most top tens with five. He's got a 9.0 average finish and is fourth in points. Again, he's only 21 years old. He's only going to get better from here. Ty Gibbs at seven. Now things start to get really interesting. Ryan Blaney continues to back up. I've got him sixth. Red hot to start the year, had three straight top five finishes. Since then, he's had three straight finishes outside of the top 10. He was okay at Bristol, but faded at the end. He wasn't very good at Coda and Richmond. Boy, he was out to lunch while his teammate contended for the victory. Hey, at least a Penske car was up front at Richmond. That at least gives me hope for the whole team. I think Blaney is still capable of striking gold on any given weekend. He's still fifth in points. I can't drop him too far. Blaney at six. In the five spot, I'll go with Christopher Bell. Phoenix, Circuit of the Americas, Richmond. The 20 team is always fast on the long run, making moves and passes that no one else in the field seems capable of. Just the latest example of their long run speed, Christopher Bell sped on pit road with only like 100 laps to go at Richmond, had to serve his penalty under green. There was only one caution the rest of the way, you know, with two laps to go, yet Bell was able to drive all the way back up to a sixth place finish. That is unbelievable. 
20 team looks good. Four straight top 10 finishes after that rough day at Las Vegas. Christopher Bell's in my top five. At number four, Young Money Kyle Larson. Up, down, up, down. One at Las Vegas. Dominated max points. Eh, was kind of off at Phoenix. Couldn't do anything when back in traffic. Top five at Richmond yesterday. Also led 144 laps. Lost control of this race in stage two with that Kyle Busch caution. But the pit crew shined once again. Briefly got him back out front late. The five team, as I've said all along, they're the complete package. Notable stat, Kyle Larson has led the most laps in the NASCAR Cup Series so far this season. Larson at four. At number three, Dennis the Menace. <laughs> Denny Hamlin, third in points right now after picking up his second points paying win of the season. Another team that I think is just the complete package right now. Hamlin had top five speed the whole second half of that Richmond race. The pit crew with a sub nine second stop got him the lead for the final overtime restart. And Hamlin again, being smart, he's a veteran. He knows how this game is played. Pushed the envelope, got the job done. Did he jump the start? Should it have been called? Yeah, yeah. That's honestly why I'm not jumping Hamlin up a couple more spots. <laughs> Top three is good for Hamlin at this point. At number two, I'll go with the other two-time winner this year, William Byron. Another driver who had kind of a quiet night at Richmond, but a quiet night for William Byron is a seventh place finish. That's pretty great. I was a little worried after Phoenix, where again, Byron, once he got stuck back in traffic, you know, unlike the Gibbs cars, he couldn't go anywhere. Then he got wrecked early at Bristol, hadn't seen much from Byron at the shorter ovals to start the year. Encouraging to see him run solidly inside the top 10 all night at Richmond. William Byron at number two, which means we've got a new face in the number one spot. Give it to points leader Martin Truex Jr. 228 laps led last night. He's led multiple laps in six straight races, has five straight top 10 finishes. Look, it took an extremely unlucky caution with two laps to go, a blazing fast pit stop by his teammate, and a screwy restart at the end to keep the 19 out of victory lane. This is a top five team every single week, regardless of track. That first win of the year is coming soon for Martin Truex Jr. There you go, post Richmond out of the groove power rankings. Do you agree with how I shuffled drivers about this week? Believe me, those two Hendrick teammates, they're knocking on the door of a spot in the top 10. Logano, show me more consistency, you'll be here too. Brad Keselowski, there's a lot of drivers just outside this top 10 trying to break in. But these are the faces I settled on this week. Let me know what you think down in the comment section. Thanks for tuning in, folks. I appreciate you watching this video. Leave a like if you enjoyed. Subscribe if you're new to the channel and you love all things NASCAR. And as always, a very big thank you to my generous Patreon supporters. You guys keep this show growing every single month. I will see you all again tomorrow. Thanks again for watching. Have a wonderful rest of your Monday.